But the most serious battle the court has faced was not among themselves. It has been between them and the government. The issue is terrorism. The government on one side would be championing security, the judiciary, liberty. The event that triggered this conflict was 9-11. An astonishing series of acts of terrorism has been perpetrated in the United States. Countless numbers of people were killed and injured when at least three... The Blair government responded with an unusual measure. They passed an anti-terrorism act that would allow them to lock up foreign suspects without trial. The change was this feeling we're all under threat and in a state of a national emergency there's always a reaction to play it safe. If you're worried about somebody, lock him up. Well, you only have to state that proposition to realize the dangers it carries. Who's going to take the decision? The executive. By 2004, the government had imprisoned 17 suspects in Belmarsh prison. None of them had been charged. The chain of events that followed threatened to destabilize the entire relationship between the executive and the judiciary. For not only was the government violating an ancient British principle, they were contradicting their own Human Rights Act passed three years earlier. Just think about what the great majority of the British public would think if a member of their family could be hauled off by the police and locked up indefinitely, not told why, not given the evidence, not given an opportunity to challenge. It's the thin end of the wedge. It's fine if you start on the assumption that they're not going to lock up anyone unless the individual actually is a terrorist, you just can't quite prove it. But the risk is that they're going to lock up people who are innocent, who are not terrorists. And these people are going to be there indefinitely, on suspicion. And that is such a horrific prospect. In 2004, the highest court in the land was still the House of Lords, with the Law Lords presiding. And it was here that the case between the imprisoned suspects and the government ended up. The prisoners' lawyers pointed out an error in the government's logic. If the act was designed to lock up potential terrorists, why lock up only foreigners? It doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that that's not rational, <laughs> because there are plenty of homegrown, non-foreign terrorists whom they were not going to lock up or suspected terrorists in the same way. Uh, and the one thing that the law does not allow you to do is be irrational. The government's case hinged on whether the threat the country faced was so serious that they could depart from the Human Rights Act. If it wasn't, it meant the government was violating its own treaty and threatening fundamental freedoms an enormous amount was at stake. The verdict made headline news. Good evening. Today's ruling on the government's policy of detaining foreign terror suspects without trial is of such constitutional significance that nine rather than five law lords sat in judgment and they have delivered an extraordinarily strong denunciation. Fundamental rights are protected in our democracy they belong to everyone, whoever they may be, and wherever they have come from. The law lords rejected the government case. Lord Hope recognized how much was at stake. It's not very difficult to understand that if the rule of law were not there, uh, then the pressures would go on pressing, and the, 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 the extent of the invasion of liberty would, would widen, people would simply disappear, things would be silenced, the freedom of the press would be trampled on. It's our job to see that that simply does not happen. The government reacted strongly and accused the judiciary of being irresponsible. Jack Straw went public on the radio. The law lords, I, mean, I understand their anxieties, and all of us are very anxious about these powers, are simply wrong. And, and on, on this, this huge dilemma of how you balance uh, liberty and order, the most important liberty is the right to life. They were uh, very upset, I think, by our decision. It's a good illustration, I think, of the fact that in an acute emergency, decisions can be taken which threaten the rule of law. Uh, and which require objective 
dispassionate review. At, at that time, did you have any doubts? No, I thought the decision was absolutely right. But the battle was not over. The government believed that there were terrorists living amongst us and insisted on special powers to contain them. The result was control orders, a form of house arrest keeping suspects confined for up to 18 hours a day. Within months of the new orders, the terrorist threat became a fact. Central London is rocked by a series of terrorist attacks. Police speak of many casualties. The terrorists hit without warning at the height of the morning rush hour on the crowded transport system. The case for control orders suddenly seems stronger. What has been confirmed today is that terrorist cells continue to operate to devastating effect in the UK. The mood had changed. There was an intense nervousness, a jumpiness. How would the judiciary act now if a challenge to the new control orders came before them? The measures were designed to get round the Human Rights Act by restricting a suspect's liberty, not by depriving them of it. But the problem was distinguishing between the two. The only control orders that you can have are ones that don't involve a deprivation of liberty, but only a restriction on liberty. How long do they have to be under a house arrest for it to be deprivation? How long do they have to be allowed out of the house for it to be merely a restriction? Making this distinction was not easy, but it was essential. It is extremely difficult to prescribe whether it should be 12 hours or 12 days, uh, but the law acts on evidence. Uh, and uh, what we require to be persuaded of is that there is justification in the form of tangible evidence uh, for any encroachment on the liberty of the subject. Suspects living under control orders challenged the government over the length and won. 18 hours was ruled unlawful. So next, the government settled on 16 hours, but moved a suspect miles from his home. Now, completely isolated from his family and friends, the question was whether this was so harsh that it was almost as bad as prison. The result was that in 2010, the new government found itself in court. 16 hours, you know if you're the Secretary of State that you are in very dangerous territory. And, and therefore, there's nothing wrong or surprising about saying, and you'd better have done your homework on the effects. Had the government's control order virtually destroyed the suspect's family life? We're talking about an individual who's only been moved an hour and three quarters um, away from London. With, with to a place it's a pretty big only. I have members of my family who live in London and other members of my family who live rather closer than that. And the difference in the occasions on which I see them is quite enormous. Well, conversely, one, one might also point to the fact that for, for some people, an hour and three quarters by train is daily commuting for, well, for families imagine to Imagine the children's reaction to every week, every Sunday being dragged off to that place. I mean, no, nobody would expect that to carry on indefinitely, would they, Mr. Tan? Imagine it. Another Sunday. Oh, gosh, we're off up, up there again. The government lost the case again. Separated from the heat of politics, the justices had decided that this control order went too far. It's a how long is a piece of string question to some extent, and the kind of area where you need an objective tribunal listening to argument on both sides and ultimately drawing the line. But nobody can suggest that there is a particular right place and the wrong place to draw that line. But all these defeats for the government have raised a fundamental constitutional question. Should an unelected court be telling a democratically elected government what it can and can't do? We apply the Human Rights Convention because that's what Parliament has told us we've got to do. And until Parliament tells us otherwise, that is our duty. And we are complying with the wishes of Parliament in doing that. And Parliament hasn't taken the step of saying, right, we're going to tear up human rights. 
and it won't. Why won't it? Because it appreciates uh, that fundamental human rights are of fundamental importance. In fact, the present government is still talking about reforming the Human Rights Act. It also intends to replace control orders. But as long as Parliament is passing complex laws and signing treaties, there is potential tension between the government and the judiciary. Everybody learns lessons, and um, the way the system works in this country, and it's to the credit of everybody, including the executive, I think, is that they respect decisions which are taken against them. They may not like them, but there they are. One hopes that that process will have, um, as it were, cleared the way for a future where the executive is more aware of what can be done and what can't be done and the way in which it should go about its affairs. We must be a bulwark against executive decisions which we are uh, convinced infringe impermissibly uh, fundamental human rights. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, a fundamental uh, precept it's a, it's a, its importance can't be overestimated that uh, the executive uh, cannot have access to unbridled power this series of high profile battles between the government and the judiciary have made it absolutely clear to the justices how crucial their independence is we have to fulfill the function we have as um, the, the guardians of the rule of law. And if it comes into collision with the political view, uh, well, so be it. The final Court of Appeal had always been independent of the government, even when they were sitting in the House of Lords. But this new clear physical separation between Parliament and the Supreme Court adds weight to this vital truth. Those who make the law should be answerable to the law. The rule of law is a principle that applies in all situations. And once you, even if you're a government, have signed up to binding legal principles, there has to be somebody who decides whether you're complying with what you've signed up to or not. And the independent judiciary are the best body to do that.